Hi, okay, we're here to talk about Zen Framework optimization of a Zen Framework application. Um, obviously, I'm Rob Allen, as you can tell from your schedule. So, very, very little bit about me to start with, so you know why I'm standing up here. Uh, I've been doing PHP now since 1999 uh, with PHP 3, so I've been on PHP type websites. <coughs> Sorry, is it a bit quiet? Can, we, can I shout louder? Is that better? Worse? Can you hear me okay? I'm not a very loud speaker. And even with a mic, clearly I'm still not a very loud speaker. Okay, I'll, I'll try to talk a bit louder. Um, there's a terrible echo. Okay, yeah, so I've been developing since 1999. I am the technical director of a very small uh, web design agency in Birmingham, and we tend to make fairly small specialized sites. Um, so to give you an idea of, sort of my background, I don't write sites that have got the uh, scalability problems that, say, most big sites have. That is not the type of sites I build. So what I'm going to share today is based on the type of problems that I have, which are mostly around trying to get the application to feel fast to a user more than anything else. And though we will touch on how to get more throughput through um, a Zen Framework application to an extent. Um, I've written the book, Zen Framework in Action. Um, did anyone buy that book? Thank you. Right. There's, don't buy it now, by the way. It's out of date. So if you're thinking about buying that book, wait, because I'm writing a new book, Zen Framework 2 in action. You can see the naming convention going on here, um, which is obviously targeted at Zen Framework 2, which with any luck will be out this year. You never know. Anyway, that's the sales pitch. Optimization is a game of eliminating measurable inefficiencies if you can't reliably measure or predict the impact of an optimization, then how do you know it's worthwhile optimization? So where we started from on this talk is, if we can't measure an improvement, then it is probably not worth doing the work involved in it. So, Patrick, guy from Ireland, quoted that, and I quite liked it, so I put it up here. Um, this means that we are not interested in micro-optimizations. So if you're interested in whether a for loop is faster than a while loop, or whether you should be using for each, or referenced arrays, or something like that. This is of no interest to me whatsoever. I would far rather have maintenance and maintainable code. That is by far my biggest problem. So that's where I'm interested in. So we need to measure what we're doing. So if we are going to measure, we're going to need a baseline. Um, once we've got a baseline, we can maybe set a target for where we would like to be and then we can clear the issues that we find. And as we clear each issue, then other issues will come up, bubble up to the top as other issues that we need to fix. Um, you'll also hit a diminishing returns problem. At some point, the cost of improving the performance is greater than you're prepared to bother doing. Uh, you're making a lot of effort for a very small gain, at which point it's probably worth put in another server in, or doing something like that, rather than wasting your coding resources. Siege is my preferred benchmarking tool. Another option is Apache Bench. Um, you can see these slides afterwards, so they'll be available on acrobat.com slash talks. But, so that's why we've got things like URLs in here. So I'm not expecting you to go there now. <laughs> um, but yeah, Siege, Siege from uh, joedog.org is a nice little benchmarking tool. It runs on uh, Linux or Macs. And um, I don't know if it runs on Windows. It probably doesn't. If you're on Windows, use Apache Bench. Um, set it up via CGRC. The only important thing in here is benchmark equals true, because Siege has two modes, benchmarking and load testing. And we're interested in benchmarking. So we're going to run Siege. This one we're doing for 30 seconds against info.php. Um, so this is a time-based test. We run it for 30 seconds. We see what happened, what sort of throughput we got. Um, and you can set up the number of concurrent users that you want Siege to hit your website with. Because we're not worried too much about scalability, 10 users is more than enough. Run it. We get that sort of output. So you get a nice little summary. Um, this was run where localhost is one of our servers that we're currently decommissioning, one of our dedicated servers. 
so it had no other traffic on it, which made it an ideal place for me to run some tests. Um, what is it? It's a dual-core Xeon, apparently, and it's running PHP 5.3.5. So the numbers themselves don't really matter, because obviously your systems will not be what my systems are. But what we're interested in is the relative change for each thing we do. So our first baseline number is 783 transactions per second, and that's on info.php. That web page has got one single PHP statement in it, which is PHP info. So it's pretty much the smallest amount of PHP code you can write that generates a reasonable amount of HTML. There's no point in writing echo hello world, because nobody outputs just the two words onto their web pages. So 700-ish. So we're never going to do better than that, ever. So start with the basic app. ZF create project. Enable the layout, and then we run Siege. So we're going to, you, know, you run the, the standard ZF project um, Zen framework application. You get the screen up with the work and Zen framework thing. You all familiar with that? Yeah. 79 transactions per second. We've just wiped out 90% of the, the available performance of our server. Amazing, isn't it? Um, though it's not quite fair, because the Zen framework app does an awful lot, even this basic one does an awful lot more than uh, PHP info. But nevertheless, you are talking about an absolutely massive hit by using something like Zen Framework. Um, obviously, because we talk about Zen Framework here, that's what I'm using. Um, but to be honest, if you were using Solar or um, Lithium or Cake or whatever, you still see a massive drop down there. There are differences between them, but you've still taken a massive hit. OK. So we know that it's slow. The obvious thing to do is find out where it is slow. And that's what profiling is about. Um, who here has not heard of Xdebug? Thank goodness for that. <laughs> Good. You've all heard of Xdebug. Who has not got it installed on their development box? Right. Consider installing it. It's worth installing. Um, the other alternative is um, the other profiler that's actually usable is one from Zend. So if you're using Zen Studio with the Zen Debugger solution, they have a profiler in there, which is also quite good. Um, I'm not aware of any other profilers for PHP. Maybe there are some. But most people have got XDebug, so that's the one I use as well. Peck and install XDebug if you haven't already got it. Um, the output file is rather helpfully compatible with multiple different applications. So if you're on Linux, use Kcash Grind. Um, there's a Win Cache grind for Windows. There's a Mac Cool grind for OS X, which is an OS X native app. Though he charges money for it, so, and it's not that cheap, I don't believe. And finally, there's even one that works in PHP called Web Grind, which is the one I quite like. Okay, so if you've got a profile with Xdebug, you need to configure your PHP.ini. So you turn the profiler off, which is slightly counterintuitive, but it does make sense and then you enable the trigger. So this enables you to profile just the pages that you want to profile, rather than profiling every single time you go and you work on your dev server, um, which can get tedious very, very quickly with the amount of files that get created. And obviously you need to store the files it generates somewhere. Right. In order to actually get a profile to actually be generated, you add x under, xdebug underscore profile equals one to your URL and then it will drop a um, profile file into the directory. There's a handy um, extension for Firebox, which gives you a little button you can press. That's quite handy. OK, so you do that, and you get an output like that if you're using WebGrind. It's not particularly complicated. This is the file that we've actually loaded into WebGrind. Um, you can display percent or milliseconds. 453 different functions were called to generate the stock um, Zen framework, hello world, if you like. And it took us 71 milliseconds to do so. Um, at the moment, I've sorted by total inclusive cost. So obviously, the top item is main, which is index.php, because everything starts from index.php in a Zen framework application. Then you've got send application run, then you've got some bootstrapping, dispatcher, etc. at the top. It's not actually the most useful view. If you sort by total self-cost, you'll get the most expensive stuff at the top. 
which I should have done in a screenshot, but I forgot to. So that's Xdebug. Um, biggest problem with Xdebug is it is extremely slow. Do not run it on your live server. Really, do not run it on your live server. Forget anything else. Um, XHProf, however, is much more lightweight. Who's heard of XHProf? OK, a few people. Um, it's from Facebook. Um, the Facebook engineering people needed to do some profiling. Um, at their sort of level, you don't really use a single little testing server. So they wanted something that they could inject into some of their live servers. Hence, they wrote XHProf. So you can use XHProf on a live site, at least in theory. Um, XD, uh, sorry, Facebook, of course, have a different set of problems to the rest of us, so they have a different sort of resources to solve them. Two different URLs there. I recommend reading both of them if you're interested in XHProf. Very, very useful. Um, but basically, you install it, and then you set up a um, prepend and an append file um, via your php.ini, which initiates the profiling and then turn it off and store it. Um, and again, you get a sort of web page result. One of the nice things about XHProf, though, is that you can profile just snippets of your application. So although I said, you know, put it in a pend and prepend, there's nothing to stop you just putting it around a particular part of your application. So let's say you're not interested in Zen Frameworks overhead anyway. So you could start profiling at the start of your controller action and stop profiling at the end of your controller action. And now you've isolated your profile to just the bit you wrote. So it's quite interesting. It's quite a nice little tool for doing things like that. Output that's like that. It's a web page. Um, if you follow the tutorials on the last page, um, whenever you run through your um, testing, you get a link to the profile at the bottom of the page, which is quite handy. And then you get this page up. And again, this is ordered incorrectly, but you should order by something called exclusive wall time. Um, I don't know why they call it wall time. I'm sure there's a really good engineering reason, and it makes sense if you understand what it does internally. OK, absolute time. So, wall time, the time the clock on the wall, apparently. Which, we don't have a clock on the wall. <laughs> um, yeah, so what we've got there is, the, yeah, you want to order your methods by which one took the longest to run. The inclusive one will include any other methods that were called from this method, which is clearly not as helpful. OK, so that's how we're going to measure stuff. And let's talk about some obvious things that you're probably already doing. Um, and if you're not doing, these are where you get the biggest win, which is something like APC. Uh, who hasn't got APC installed or a bytecode cache of some sort? A few people. Okay. Consider installing one. Um, you don't have to do anything else with it, but just installing it will speed up your applications um, significantly. And that's, it's a bit low. I should have got a bigger slide. Um, but what, what it says at the bottom is that once I put APC on onto my test server, that 79 transactions per second became 311 transactions per second. So I gained getting on for a four times speed increase or run in Peckle install APC. You're never, ever going to get that sort of performance increase for that little work in any other way. So you really, really must be using a bytecode cache of some sort. Well, do you believe that APC is the best one out there? No, I don't believe that APC is. The uh, question was, is APC the best one out there for some framework? The answer is, I have no idea. Um, there's Accelerator, Xcache, um, APC, there's Memcache. Memcache is not a bytecode, is it? No. Um, Optimizer Plus from Zend are the four obvious ones that I can think of. I really don't mind. Um, I'm sure there are micro differences between them, but I would be amazed if there was a significant difference that really mattered. Test them. Um, APC was the one that worked first time for me, so that's the one I've always used. <laughs> um, it's, a, it's a very boring reason. But just working is always a win in my book. Okay, so that's the number one reason, number one thing you should be doing to increase the performance of your Zen framework application. Second thing you should be doing is you should be cashing out stuff. Most of the problems with your application, doesn't really matter if it's in framework or not, is usually related to long-running processes 
that do not have to be run for every single page request. Right, the most common one is accessing the database. It's highly unlikely that when you pull data out of the database now, that if you were to pull that same uh, SQL statement again in half a second time, that you'll get different data. Under normal circumstances, you'll get the same data again. Right. Doing a SQL query is not the fastest thing in the world, ever. So it is one of the most obvious things that you want to remove from your applications. So use a cache. Pretty little picture, because I did it earlier, and uh, I like to put up pretty little pictures. Um, but very, very loosely, you get the request from the browser, you check whether you've got a cache version. If you do, you read the data, process it, and send it straight out to the, to the browser again. So your flow through your application is much, much shorter. Shorter flows through your application are invariably faster. If you've got, here's your slow read from the database. You don't have your cache version. You create your query, read the data, store data in the cache, and you off again. Put a sensible lifetime that makes sense to your application, and you're done. Not particularly difficult, and it'll probably be a fairly big win in terms of the performance of your application. Okay. Who here is doing caching of database queries? Okay, about half or so. Good. Um, if you're going to do it in a Zen framework application, you may as well use Zend Cache. There are other cache um, options out there, um, but given that you're already using Zen Framework, Zend Cache is the obvious one to use. In application.ini, you can configure the cache manager, which is quite an easy way to get Zen Cache up and running. Um, the cache manager resource, so I would recommend doing that. Alternatively, you can do page level caching. Now, given that you can cache out the database, you could cache out all the PHP to all intents and purposes. Just generate the HTML, store the HTML to disk. When the user comes along requesting the same page, just serve in the HTML back. That's quick. That's really quick. Because um, now you're bordering on faster than PHP. Not quite, because you've got to work out which uh, file to load. But it's really, really fast. Biggest downside, any dynamic data on that page is now baked into your cache. So if you're doing an e-commerce site and you've got um, your current number of items in the basket or something like that in the top right-hand corner, well, if you cache that bit, then everyone sees they've got five items in their basket or whatever. So you have to be really careful with page caching, but it is really fast if you can use it. Again, Zen Cache has got a page um, front-end component, which makes it really easy to implement as well. However, this isn't a caching talk, so we're going to ignore caching from now on. I'm going to assume that you've cached out the really, really big, slow parts of your application. So we've done the easy stuff. So let's talk about some ZF-specific stuff now um, that will actually affect the performance of your application. Loading files. Zen Framework has a lot of files. Um, you know that because it takes a while to download it from the website. It says loads and loads of files in it. Um, every single class, every single interface has got its own class. So therefore, the reason why there is 440-something files uploaded, because they all have to be loaded one at a time, loading of files is a fairly key area of improving the performance of Zen Framework. Um, most obvious thing to look at is the include path. The traditional way and the expected way to set up a Zen Framework application is that you define your application path and then you reference the library from the application path and then you add it to your include path. So we essentially put the slash library folder onto the include path and then the autoloader will start loading all your Zen Framework um, class files. It's really, really important that the Zen Framework um, directory is first on your include path. It makes a significant difference. Um, this is what the Zend Framework, ZF Create project does. It generates this sort of um, code into your index.php. So if you use ZF Create project, then it will be correct. If you created your own bootstrap in your own loading up of Zen Framework, then check that the wherever you've put Zend, the library Zend, is the first item on your include path. 
I did some testing where I put these two around the other way and I removed the real path um, call at the front and the transaction rate dropped 7 8%, something like that. So you get an 8% boost by having the Zend framework files at the first item in your include path. Fortunately, as I say, the ZF Create project does it first correctly for us. Use auto load only. Um, in ZF Framework 1, all the files that make up part of the library do not use auto loading at all. You do not have to use an auto loader with a ZF Framework 1 application. Back in 2005, when ZF Framework was created, this seemed like a good idea, maximum flexibility. In practice, A, everyone uses an autoloader nowadays, and B, some people found it was faster if you let the autoloader do the work. So to remove all those require once statements from Zen Framework source code, you run a find followed by an exargs and a sed, and someone else generated this, and not me. Um, interestingly, sed works differently on Macs, so there is a different command if you're doing it on Macs to if you're doing it on Linux. And if you're doing it on Windows, I've got no idea how you do it. You probably use a Linux box and then copy the files back. Um, I've no, no idea. You Sigwin. Um, yeah, so when I was doing some testing on some simple applications, I found not a lot of difference on this. So I would advise testing it as to whether it actually makes a performance difference or not. Um, I asked Matthew about it, the project leader of Zen Framework, and he said if you're on 5.2, then it makes more difference than if you're on 5.3. So consider whether it's actually worth doing for your actual application and where you actually deploy. But it's definitely one of those items that is worth measuring. Okay, so we talked about all that. Here's one of these pictures where I've sorted by social self-cost. And number one is Zend Loader Load File. I told you loading files was a big thing within Zen Framework. It takes a lot of time. That's what load file looks like. This is why it takes a fair old while to do. We do something called a security check. We do some directory imploding stuff. We do a get include path. We set an include path. We check whether we need to do an include once or an include. There's a lot going on, which, to be honest, isn't really needed in production really helpful in development when you get it wrong and the wrong file loads or the class isn't in the right file and things like that. In production, you don't need any of that. Don't care. You know what you do in production because hopefully you've tested. You do all tests before you put life. <laughs> At least basically. Good. So, how about we do that? We change load file to application env equals live include file name. That's an awful lot faster. Much, much faster. Don't do it in development because you lose some benefits. But in, in um, a live environment, if you need the performance at the Zen framework level, that's a worthwhile doing, worthwhile measuring up and checking. Um, what did I see? Again, I saw about 7% increase improvement in performance, something like that. You get more if you're not using APC, but if you're not using APC, then you probably don't care. Okay. Send application. Who here uses send application? Okay. Everyone's heard send application is really slow. Um, it's certainly much slower than rolling your own bootstrap system. One of the main reasons that it's slow is that it standardizes the bootstrapping. So you can write a bootstrap module, uh, yeah, module resource once, and then you can reuse it across multiple projects. So from a maintenance point of view, if you've got multiple Zen Framework projects out there like my company does, the whole Zen application functionality and feature set is a huge benefit to us from a maintenance point of view. But it does cost you a little bit. One of the bigger bits it costs you is the ini file. This is what the index.php um, file is uh, from ZF Create Project. We instantiate a Zen a send application object with uh, the application.ini um, passed into it as its second parameter. How often do you change your config file once you're in production? Not very often. You certainly do not need to be passing application.ini every <coughs> single request. 
I wrote Zen config. It's not the fastest in the world. It's fast enough, but it's certainly not that quick. It depends on pass any file, which equally is not that quick. Um, what the send, frame, uh, send application actually does is it takes that any file, it puts it into Zen config, and then it calls to array on it to create an array. And then it uses the array internally. We could cache that out. You've got APC installed anyway. So I've done an APC example here. If you're using the accelerator, you'll probably need a different caching mechanism, memcached or something. Um, it's a little bit of code, but down at the bottom, Zend application will accept an array as its config element, ra uh, option rather, in, as instead of an ini file. So if you can get an array without having to pass the ini file, then you're going to get a performance increase. And that's what this bit here does. APC fetch try to load in a config file. If the config file isn't a Zen config, actually that's code wrong. Um, if you don't have a config file, then you want to instantiate a config file, convert it to an array, and then store it again. So now you've got an array the very first time you run the um, request, and then every subsequent request doesn't need to repass your config variables. Massive performance increase for Zen application. Of course, it's tiny compared to the database work, but for Zend application, it's quite a big increase. Again, you're talking another 5%, something like that, you're going to get from doing that. At least, that's what I get. Whether you get that or not depends on your measurements, because you are measuring everything. Don't even bother trying this stuff out unless you're going to measure the before and after. Because every single time we do something like this, we're now complicating and adding more code. We've got to remember why we did this code. If you're getting a 1% increase and that doesn't matter to you, then don't waste your time doing it. ZenDB table. Anyone using ZenDB table? Okay, a few people. Anyone using Doctrine? Okay. I don't know a lot about Doctrine, but I suggest you check with their documentation because I bet they've got some performance increases in there somewhere as well. Um, ZenDB table, though, reads some metadata from the database every single time you access the database table once. It caches it for the request itself internally as a static. But essentially, every time you do a, a new request to the first time you, the users table or whatever, it's going to go and read the metadata. Again, how often do you change your database schema? Whilst, once you're in production, you've got live people there. You never change your production. Now, when you do change your uh, database schema, you've probably got a deployment strategy. And if you don't have a deployment strategy, then you need to get a deployment strategy. You really need a deployment strategy, but that's a different talk. Um, at which point, you could clear the cache. So you should cache out the database described table. You really, really do not want to be doing it. Fortunately, the ZenDB table people realize this. So you don't actually have to do any work whatsoever other than set up a few uh, config settings in application.ini and then ZenDB table will take care of itself. So this is the absolutely simplest thing you could possibly do. You set your front-end um, data uh, Zend cache element to a core. I've put a two-hour lifetime on here so that it will automatically clear itself out. In practice, I would recommend setting that to um, zero, which will mean cache forever, so that then you delete the cache files during your deployment strategy. Automatic serialization. Store to file, but you could equally store to memcache or into APC or something like that. Set up a, I've set up a uh, directory here for the file uh, backend, but obviously if you're using memcache, you set up your memcache server. Um, and lastly, on your DB resource, you set default net meta cache to the, to the cache key that you just set up. This is one of those areas where the um, resources cache manager comes into its own. So, because you can set up multiple of these caches. So, the DB one here is being used for the metadata. You can set up another one for handling, I don't know, other long running operations you've got in your code. That's why I recommend it. It's very handy. Okay, how are we doing time wise? Half an hour. Hmm, good. Zenview. Anyone here using Zenview? Anyone here not using Zenview would be a better question, wouldn't it? Anyone decided to rip out Zenview and put it in Smarty? A few people. There's nothing wrong with that. I, I don't actually have a problem with Smarty, as long as you know why you're using it. That's my main thing about Smarty. Um, 
but most people use Envue. Um, how many people have read the source code of Envue? Yeah, not quite so many. Um, that's one of the things about using the framework. You assume that the framework code itself you don't actually need to look at. You look at it as a black box. I certainly do. But every so often it's interesting to delve into it. With Zenview, the biggest performance issues are around view helpers, by far. Because that's what it does when you set call a view helper. It uses a magic method, underscore, underscore, call. That's not very quick before we even begin to worry about what underscore, underscore, call is doing. Magic methods are not as fast as direct methods for any given class. There's a level of indirection. By definition, it's slower. Then it checks whether the helper is already loaded. Once, assuming it is loaded, instantiated or whatnot, it then calls call user func array. I don't know if anyone's ever profiled call user func array. I think it is the slowest function within PHP. I could be wrong, but it's really not a quick function. It is a very, very slow way of executing a method. However, if you have multiple parameters that you need to pass to a, a method that you do not know its name at compile time, it's the only way to do it. So the reason call user func array is, is here is because that's the only way to do it sensibly. Um, it is not quick. Really is not quick. Um, so for the most commonly used view helpers that you have, it's worth getting them out of using this method altogether. Which means that you need to write them directly into ZendView itself. Because when you have a when you use your PHTML file, what actually happens is that is it that is included using the include um, directive directly into a method within ZendView itself. So when you do dollar this dash greater than within your PHTML file, you're using an instance of ZendView. So you, you're in the context of ZendView. So if you had a method in ZendView that represented your view helper, you would now bypass underscore underscore call. It would be quicker. Of course, if you did that, every time new version of Zen Framework came out, you'd have to go and repatch ZendView. And that clearly is not something that anyone wants to do in the real world. So what you actually want to do is you want to create your own view class, which is an extension of ZendView, and then you want to use your own view class with your own methods in it. Something like app view. I like app as my namespace for the specific stuff that's related to Zen Framework that is for this application only. So you create a top level um, directory under library called app. We create view.php in it, which is class app view extends Zen view. That's nice and easy. You need to tell the autoloader that you've gone and done this. So you set autoloader namespaces and you add to it. It's an array. So you just add app to it. And now the Zend autoloader will load app view for us. So that's all quite easy. We can all do that. This is where it gets a little bit messy. And this is one of those flexibility points that hopefully Zen Framework 2 will make easier. Um, when you uh, use Zen Framework normally with the Zend application, the bootstrap um, has got, a, there's a resource in Zen's application called uh, view, which is initiate, instantiated by the view renderer one, I think. So when you set up the view renderer, it will create the view for you and then instantiate, uh, then attach it to the view renderer. Then when you use the layout, the layout gets its view from the view renderer. The easiest solution to, oh, unfortunately, the way it's been written, you can't just set a config variable and say, this is the class I want you to use as your view. That would have been really helpful, but they never did that. Instead, it's buried deep in the middle of the view resource. The easiest way to get around that is to write your own one. By far the quickest way to do it is to drop an underscore init view method into your bootstrap. That is actually slightly faster than using a resource anyway, which is always good. Um, and it's not that difficult to do. You do Because you've already got bootstrap.php. It's always in your application folder. So inside there, you put in all this code, which is all really, really boring, exactly the same as the code provided by the um, resource itself, except for we changed that bit there. 
So we deleted four characters and added three new ones. And we had to put the rest of that around it, which is basically boilerplate. Um, it doesn't actually do a lot. We do things with uh, dot types. Uh, we do something with content type, and then we attach it to the view renderer, view help, uh, action helper. There's not actually a lot going on there, but it, it's a little bit more complicated than it needed to be. Um, but having done that, this dash URL. URL happened to be the one I chose, because I reckon that's the most commonly used view helper in the world, pretty much. Um, any time you need to get a link with inside your Zen framework application, you should use the URL view helper. It has a lot of conveniences, especially if you're using multiple routes. It does make life much, much easier. Um, and it's not a particularly difficult view helper anyway, so you transplant it from the view helper, you put it in your own app underscore view, and suddenly you've removed an awful lot of cool user funk array calls. Especially if you've got list page. List pages are great for this. You know, 50 items on list page, You've got an edit and a delete button. That's 100 calls for that URL. And suddenly, it's now just a direct method call. So it's nice and quick. Um, it's probably not worth putting all your view helpers into app view. It's not as easy to maintain as having them separate in their own classes, especially for some more complicated ones. Um, so I would profile and measure, find out which view helpers actually make a difference. If you've got one view helper that you use once on one page, yeah, I wouldn't bother. Leave it where it is. Don't make life harder for maintaining your application just for speed. It will bite you later. Yeah? Did it help instantiating the view helpers manually and calling? Um, instantiating and calling. Good question. Yeah, probably. Except, of course, you'll now have to instantiate all the time unless you create your own caching around in instantiating that view helper. Yeah, sorry, uh, Tace just suggested another alternative is that in you could instantiate your view helper yourself within the view um, script and then call it directly. That would also bypass the underscore underscore call method within send view. The only downside is you've now got a whole load of boilerplate code that you're putting all over your application. At which point, why are you using the, application, uh, the framework in the first place? Yeah, you may as well go back to the bad old days. <laughs> um, so yes, you could do that. Personally, I wouldn't bother. I think you'd be better off just, you know, for the ones that actually matter, just doing a subclass as then view and forgetting about it. Um, I've gone on two now. Sorry about that. The escape view helper should be the second, if not the first, most common view helper you're using. Who knows what the escape helper, who uses the escape view helper? Who doesn't use it? Okay, interesting. Um, I see you have a different solution to making sure that you escape all your output characters. <laughs> You're better. <laughs> right, okay. Um, the escape view helper essentially allows you, uh, converts any string that you give it in via HTML entities or HTML special chars or any other method of your choosing. Usually you use it to convert ambassands into ampersand AMP semicolon and get rid of angle brackets which have got the scripts tag in next to it. So it handily converts any nasty um, people trying to get some XSS stuff into your application, handily prevents that happening pretty much. This is the code for it. Because it is configurable, because Zen Framework is a framework and we like to be configurable, you can pick whether you have HTML special chars or you can have HTML entities or you have one of your own choosing. Right. You see what we do? We call user func on it again. Or we call user func array even, depending on which particular escape method you're using. Expensive. Very expensive. Okay, so this allows you to configure whether you're using HTML special chars or HTML entities for your escaping. Hands up, who's ever changed that? Good, it's not just me. Nobody ever, ever changes it. Ever. Nobody does. So you may as well rewrite it to do that. You go use HTML special chars anyway. Or if you choose HTML entities, replace HTML special chars with HTML entities. Pass in the correct parameters, and you're done. 
Really, really not, not difficult. If you know what your encoded is, you can even get rid of this bit. Um, so, yeah, I highly recommend that if you should measure this and see if it makes a difference in your app. But it's an interesting, slow, obvious slow point that can be coded out for minimal amount of effort. OK. We're on to the last few slides now, so we're running slightly ahead of time. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple of other items um, which aren't particularly code-related, but uh, fairly obvious if you think about it. Who doesn't use a fav icon? Who doesn't specify one of them? Does everyone put a fav icon on every site? I should have lifted that up, really. If you don't use a fav icon, the URL rewrite rules are going to call back to index.php which is then going to call the error controller and generate a 404 page because you didn't have a fav icon. That means you've run through the entire ZF stack again, which is 556 different functions, just to say we don't have a fav icon. The interesting thing about that is that something like Firefox or IE, or presumably Chrome as well, I haven't tested, call that every single request. I don't know why, but they do, especially IE. IE calls for fav icon every single time you go to the next page on any given website if it hasn't already got it cached internally on itself. So you're 404 in every single time because you're using the same framework standard error controller, hence it tries again every single time. So from the user's point of view, the time till the spinner stops spinning has just increased by 113 milliseconds for no apparent reason. <coughs> really, really minor thing, but in terms of making performance of your app appear better to your user, just a blank favicon.ico sitting in your root folder, in your public folder, will actually make the app fill a little bit faster. And you'll save a whole load of design framework work. So. Last one, who's read the manual? There's a performance guide in the manual. Right. You should have been nodded along to half the stuff I said if you had read it, because I nicked half the talk out of it. Um, I highly recommend you read the manual. There is a performance guide in there. It is worth reading because it gives some background onto some of the recommendations they have. They tell you why it's a good idea. So it, it's, a, it's worth pulling up the performance guide and having a read through it and deciding if it applies to your particular situation. All right, so I'm going summarise now. Use a bytecode cache. Under all circumstances, use a bytecode cache. Cache the slow stuff. To a certain extent, you can probably stop there. I will lay good money that all your performance problems will be solved by the time you finish those first two points. But if you do have further PHP-related performance problems because you think Zen Framework is too slow, and you have measured that that is where your problem is, then start with Zend Loader, then worry about ZendDB table, and worry about app view, some sort of view thing. Then worry about all the little stuff. But to be honest, by that point, you're probably chasing stuff where you may as well look at different solutions altogether. Run memcached or multiple servers or something and load balance them. Can I get any questions? No questions. Oh, there's a question. Oh, he's got a mic, so I don't have to repeat the question to everyone. Hi. Um, We've had some significant problems with uh, Zen Date. Uh, oh, specifically, I didn't Zen Date, did instancing I? it. Have you got any tips for using it, or should we just not? Unfortunately, this talk's recorded, so. Unfortunately, this talk's recorded, so I can't actually tell you what I think about Zen Date. Um, but I will say that PHP 5.3's date time extension is what I would use. Um, <laughs> when I, I did the caching talk, which talked about how to cache. Um, and the details of using send cache to cache out database calls and things like that. And at the beginning, I wanted to show that the database call on my tutorial was, or was it tutorial? No, it's a page from the book, was actually the slow bit. So I ran it through the profiler, and send date was the slowest part of my application by 50%. Half the page load time was send date doing date conversions. I don't know if yours is around the same, but it's amazing how slow bits of Zendate can be. And if you're not using all the functionality that Zendate gives you, 
then you are throwing away an awful lot of performance for no benefit. With PHP 5.2, um, the date time extension in 5.2 is nowhere near as comprehensive and powerful as Zendate is. Zendate is a really powerful component. It does an awful lot. If you're not using it, though, it's an awful lot of overhead for stuff you're not using. So, and in 5.3, date time is pretty much caught up. There's very little that date time doesn't do that Zendate does, if anything. So I would recommend using date time. It's in C. It's an extension. It's going to be quick. And Derek wrote it, and Derek knows what he's doing. Um, so yeah, that's what I would do. Yeah, Zendate is, yeah, personally, unless you need the functionality, do not use it. It's also got that nasty formatting problem. So I'm going on a rant about Zendate now, aren't I? Um, has anyone else used Zendate? Has anyone else been bitten by the fact that the format specifiers are not the same as the date function? Or is it just me? It uses different formatting parameters. So, you know, a capital Y is not the same as, it's not the year as it is in the date function. It's a different, slightly different meaning. And it matters on the last three days of every year. And they're the only three days it matters. It uses ISO formatting rather than what the date, uh, the date method does, which is really annoying. So, yeah, just don't use it. Unless you need it, functionality, of course. Then you have to use it, and you're stuck with it. <laughs> yeah? Some of the things you've been uh, talking about for optimization, are some of those things already in Zen Framework 2? Yes. Kind of. Um, the, the, especially the Zend Loader stuff. Zend Loader in ZF2 doesn't have an include file name in it, but they have completely reworked the file loading system, Zen 2, Zen Framework 2, which is, I think Matthew said, 700% faster than Zen Framework 1's. It, it, it's at the point where it is fast enough that you will not care, that you're not doing a direct include. What they've done is they've done a class map. Um, when you do auto loading, there's two or three different ways of doing it, but essentially it comes down to, you need to work out which file to load given this class name. Now, the way Zen Framework works is the underscores can be mapped directly to fast separators, and you're done, essentially. Not particularly a complicated method. It's lovely as that result. So the, the, the way that we're going in Zen Framework 2 is that if you know the path to the Zen folder directly, then you can just append the correct bit of string for the actual file and call include on it. So if you know that Zen, the, the Zend folder, or the Zend namespace, as it will be in Zend Framework 2, because we have 5.3 namespaces, if you know that is in slash user slash include slash PHP slash Zend, then all you need to do is do dot equals view slash uh, view dot PHP or something, and then do an include on it. That's quick. So there's an array lookup followed by an include. Now. In development, it will be at the path level. Now, that will result in a number of stat calls made by PHP to check the file is there and things like that. What we'll be doing in production in um, Zen Framework 2 is we'll be dropping out even the concatenation and we'll be storing the complete path to the file against its class name. So there'll be a massive great big array where it's got Zend underscore view, maps to slash user slash include slash blah blah. Send, flat, send slash something slash something maps to blah, 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 etc. So it's simply a case of an array lookup followed by an include. That's really quick. So How long does it take to generate that array? Oh, who cares? You only have to generate it once. That's, this is this whole thing about having a deployment strategy, which I mentioned earlier. When you've got a deployment strategy where you have a repeatable process for deployment, you can do pre-caching of stuff. So if you know that you're going to need to I don't know, read your any file and convert it to an array. You could do it whilst you're deploying your files to the server in the first place. You need a, cache, uh, a, class, a class path map, then you do it whilst you're deploying to the server. So it doesn't really matter if it takes 10 seconds, because you only got to do it once every time you do a deploy. Obviously, Zen Framework 2 itself will come with pre built class paths maps anyway, so you won't need to worry about Zen Framework, but you'll obviously want to do it for your own classes. So, and do them on deploy. It's, uh, just get a deployment strategy. Anyone else? We've probably got time for another question or two. 
I think. Yeah, we've got about five minutes according to my clock. I, I know this is kind of off, a little bit off topic, but given what you just said, when um, when is in framework two going to be kind of downloadable? I seem to be missing a piece of string. How long is it? Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, we haven't got. We've got some MVC interface proposals that have been accepted. The next set of proposals will be for the MVC implementation itself and the changes required to MVC form application as a sort of bundle. I, I just don't know. Um, I expect that once we have the MVC bits, development will magically ramp up much faster. Because at the moment, all the contributors are basically waiting for MVC to be nailed down so that we know where to, our components will fit in and how they'll work nicely. Certainly, I'm waiting on Zen Config till I know what the MVC is doing and the, um, the lead it gives in the way we're going forward. And I think a lot of the other component maintainers are doing the same thing. When I gave the talk in Northwest, I said I thought there'd be a beta around Easter. I think that's going to be later than that now. But I'm not going to give you a number because you're going to tweet it and then Matthew's going to say, why did you give them that number? <laughs> I just don't know. I haven't got a clue, I'm afraid. It's bound to be this year. <laughs> I hope it's this year because I've got a book to write and I want to make money on it. <laughs> so you should all buy my book when it comes out. Anyone else? Um, yeah, I like have it? one. You have one. Um, about the auto-loading and including of the files, what about, what? I don't know when they introduced this, but what about the plugin loader cache? I, I don't know a lot about the plugin loader stuff. Um, personally, I recommend ripping it out to put it in front of two's in, because it's better. Um, and this is, comes down to the, what I was saying all the way through. Measure it and find out if you actually have a problem. Most people don't use that many plugins. And if you're not using that many plugins, it doesn't actually come up in any of your profiling because it's just not a big enough number to be important. Um, yes, it's not particularly quick. And Zen Framework 2's plugin loader is much, much faster than Zen Framework 1's, completely faster. But unless you're actually seeing it in your production site, I personally wouldn't worry about it. In fact, that goes for everything I've talked about. If you're not seeing it, don't bother. You know, there are better things to do. You're not going to make any money every time you implement one of these. You, know, you will make money if you write a new website for a new client. So you know, put your resources where they actually make money. If you've got a slow site and it is costing you money, then clearly making that site faster is worth doing. So. Okay, it seems like that's everyone. So thank you very much for listening.